Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Quantum Leap Advantage audio newsletter. Today I'm going to talk about something that's critically important, and it is the 11 step plan that takes you from an idea, the inception of an idea, to the actual execution or culmination of that idea. Now, the first thing is you have to identify the idea. Now, this may be a revelation. It may be a dream that you've had. It may be uh, a concept to, be, to build a better mousetrap. It may be uh, a number of things, but it's something that you have decided that you're going to build your uh, exponential quantum leap, quantum leap action plan around. Now, once you've identified the idea, the second step is you have to investigate it. For those of you that have heard me speak before, you know that Constantine Grazos, the CEO of a NASA shipping line and the right-hand man to Aristotle and NASA for more than 60 years, told me in the late 70s and again through the early 80s until he passed away that, Mr. Pena, the more you investigate, the less you'll have to invest. And I'm here to tell you that the reason that step two and again step three of the 11-step plan is investigation it's because the more you will investigate, the less you'll have to invest over your financial lifetime. I have been saved countless, countless embarrassing situations uh, by investigating. In fact, many of you that have heard me speak before know that I have a full-time private investigator on staff that goes through a very succinct due diligence process on anybody that I may contemplate, might contemplate being in business with, and all the principles of the organizations that I might uh, uh, partner up with. Okay, so step one is identify the idea. Step two is investigate. Step three, again, is investigate. Now, this investigation process, as you'll see as we go through the rest of the 11 steps, is an ongoing process. The investigation process never really ends. The investigation process is something that you will be fine-tuning. It could very well be for many, many years because things happen. Things happen in life to change situations. Um, some of the things that we look at are the, um, if the business is in real estate or insurance, there's various associations, there's various licenses that you have to have to be in the real estate business, to be in the insurance business, to be in the securities business, to be in the mortgage business. Um, and I go through and I have these uh, various associations have information centers. And with the advent of the PC, virtually in, in minutes, you can drum up or pull up on PC and download countless of thousands of bits of information about people that have licenses. Obviously, doctors, accountants, dentists, lawyers, all are members of associations, and they have licenses to practice. The, associate, the various associations for those different professions have endless amounts of information that you can pull up. There's the libraries. There's uh, the, the public records. There's the court systems, both for criminal and, and, and civil. So there's a lot of information <coughs> you can, you can uh, get yourself uh, involved with. Uh, some of you may know we have a book that's part of our, our library, Investigate Before You Invest, that you can be helped immensely with by uh, the purchase of uh, that item. Now, the fourth thing on the list is commitment to the idea. I mean, you're, you get committed. After you've gone through the investigation and you're fairly well convinced that it's all right to proceed, at least at this juncture, and there's no red flags, you commit yourself to the idea. What do I mean by that? I mean you get obsessed. You get crazy. You get nuts. You get psycho over it. For those of you that saw the movie in Psycho, some people have related that scene where um, Anthony Perkins breaks through the shower curtain and starts stabbing the woman as how I get obsessed and I get crazy over these, some of the projects I've been involved in the last 15 or 20 years. I mean, you, you totally lose it. You live it. You breathe it. You sleep it. That's all you talk about to your significant other. That's all you talk about to your business partners. That's all you talk about to your employees if you've got employees. That is your entire life you get absolutely stark raving obsessed. Now, why do you, let's stop a second. Dan, why, why would you act crazy about this? Why would you get obsessed? Well, 
as I've said on other audio tapes, and as I've said countless times in front of countless groups, I've never, ever, ever seen a high-performance person, a mega-successful person that wasn't enthusiastic and wasn't obsessed about what he was trying to sell, what he was trying to deliver vis-a-vis -a, -vis a product or a service. So unless you get obsessed, I can assure you, you are not going to convince anybody about anything. The biggest, not the biggest, but one of the biggest failings I see of people that are trying to implement the quantum leap advantage methodology is they're really not obsessed with it. They really don't believe in it. Because if they did believe in it, they'd be willing to take those risks. They'd be willing to sign their name on uh, the dotted line. They'd be willing to stick that neck out of the turtle shell. As you've heard me say, a, a turtle only gets a head when it sticks its neck out. And the reason they don't do it is they don't get obsessed. You've also heard me say there's a lot, there's a big difference between managing to win and managing not to lose. And the reason that most people manage not to lose as opposed to managing to win is because they're not obsessed with it. They are not living their life around it. Okay, so now step number four is we get obsessed because we're committed to the idea. Now step number five is a preliminary decision, and I, I, by that I mean you and to the extent that you have other decision makers. You sit down, remember you're obsessed, you're fired up, you bring in your people if you have any, or you bring in your spouse, or you bring in whoever your, is your close-knit group, and you share this obsession. And they used to call me the Vince Lombardi of the energy business. I used to be like Newt Rockney at halftime. I'd pump him up like a show dog. It used to be a religious experience. I used to go nuts, and I, that, a lot of that craziness was transferred to my senior people. Now, these are, the, these are your other senior people. To the extent the people that are listening to this tape have many layers of management, which will be the subject of another tape. You shouldn't have many layers of management, but we'll get into that at another time. But you should sh share this obsession. And you've got to share the idea that they have to live it totally. This may be difficult for some. If it is difficult for some, then they shouldn't probably be part of your close-knit group. So you're sharing this obsession with your senior people. You're living it totally. I mean, when you go to business lunches, when you have business meetings, when you travel on the planes, that's all you talk about. You don't talk about anything else. You don't talk about a project that you're going to do three years from now, or six months from now, or ten weeks from now. You only talk about that project. People that have heard me speak before know that the super successful, the mega successful, the, the Ross Perot's of this world focus on the few, not the many. So you're only living, living one project at a time totally. That's not to say for people that have many divisions, they won't have an obsession in Division A, an obsession in Division B, and an obsession in Division E. But most people that are listening to this tape don't fall into that category. So you live it totally. Your people are obsessed just like you are. Now, step number six is investigate again. As I told you at the beginning of this tape, the investigation is really an ongoing process. It may last weeks, it may last months, it may even last years. Investigation never ends. Again, the more you investigate, the less you have to invest. Now, at step number six, as you continue to get the reports from the investigation that's ongoing, you may see a red flag. That red flag may preclude you from continuing. Oh, but Dan, I've invested time. I've invested money. It would be embarrassing for me to pull out now. Well, I'm here to tell you that whether you've invested time, you've invested money, and whether it's going to be embarrassing to you has little or no effect. It shouldn't have little, it should have little or no effect on your decision because that's where you separate the men from the boys. That's where you separate the professionals, the mega successful, from the people that aren't because they can pull out of a deal. They can stop 20% or 30% or 40% into a transaction. That's the difference. They're disciplined. So at step number six, which is more investigation, you may very well get the red flag that sends you scurrying, sends you away from the transaction. Step number seven, 
Okay, this is what I call the action plan, or you and the decision makers are actually going to start to formulate your action plan. Now, you further, beyond the level of people that you've already brought into the fold, already started to get obsessed, you bring in the next level, and you further expand the obsession. There was a time at Great Western Resources, during our five years of, of, of extraordinary exponential growth, that everybody from the janitor, from the chairman, would be obsessed about a deal. We allowed them to know when we were in the hunt for an acquisition. We allowed them to know when we made offers. We had meetings sharing those offers. We had meetings when some of those offers were rejected. We had meetings all the way down the line where people knew that we were going to be in a proxy fight. We shared that obsession, and it was infectious. We had people that worked hard, long, long hours into the night to help us allow those ideas that started in step number one of this action plan come to fruition. You walk your talk. We're still on step number seven. It's you and the other decision makers. Now, you're expanding the obsession, but you're walking your talk. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, you never, ever, 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 ever share a doubt. Now, contrary to what you've heard in other seminars, you tell your best friend, you tell your spouse, you tell your partner as well, it's a little shaky, you want to share information, you want to be airy-fairy, Cardiff by the sea, I'm okay, you're okay, cha-cha-cha, that is all wrong. And I'm going to give an example of how this was validated, not that I needed the validation, and stamped in, like in concrete in my brain, and if I ever had a doubt about sharing doubts, this ended it. We were in the midst of a fairly difficult acquisition, and I'm getting ready to go on a long trip business, and the vice chairman of the company, who happened to be one of the other co-founders, asked me, he says, Dan, how do you think things are going? And I said, um, it's going to be an uphill battle. It's going to be tough sledding. I remember using the words tough sledding. Didn't say it was impossible. Didn't say we weren't going to get it done. Didn't, didn't say anything else. Now, I go away for three weeks, ostensibly with my team of uh, trained assassins, business assassins, working through the formula, working through our methodology. And I get back three weeks plus later, and I walk into the office, and it looked like I remember the day President Kennedy was shot, November 22, 1963, and that's what it looked like when I walked back into my offices. You thought somebody had died. You thought I had died. And I come back and I couldn't understand it. Everybody looks depressed and everybody looks dejected. And so I go into my office. I bring some people in and I ask them what the hell happened. And they said, well, uh, you know, uh, the deal's collapsed. And I, well, how did it collapse? When I left, it hadn't collapsed. Now, how come nobody called me? How come I, I, I'm coming back like, you know, like I'm, I'm landing from Mars and I'm, I'm seeing what the hell happened? And so... I made it my business to talk to the senior people, and for the next several weeks, while I was resurrecting the transaction, I went back and I followed step by step where that information came from. And as it turns out, what I had told the vice chairman, he had told his wife. When he translated it to his wife, he used some different words. When his wife was at a health spa here in, in Houston, or there in Houston, he, she was there with a wife of another senior executive. When the other wife of the senior executive asked, well, what, uh, how's, the, how's the transaction going? She said, the old man says it's probably not going to come to fruition, the old man being me. Well, I've never been in a woman's steam room, but I'm informed that they wear little towels around them, and there was a, an employee, a little girl, who was picking up towels that were on the ground, and that girl was the daughter of one of our pumpers. A pumper is a field hand that works in the field. Um, and she heard that. So she went back to her father, uh, a low-level employee, and said, Dad, the old man said, I heard Mrs. So-and-so tell Mrs. So-and-so that the old man, which is Mr. Pena, says that the deal has collapsed. Well, now, that information filtered from the very low levels of management at Great Western Resources to the upper levels. Now, if you were working on the transaction and you heard that the chairman of the board of a public corporation said the deal had collapsed, how hard would you work on it? Would you try to resurrect it when the very founder, chairman, 
president and chief executive officer said that the deal was dead? No, not likely. So it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. So virtually every single person in the company just let it drop down the toilet with a tidy bowl man. Now, when I say that if I needed any validation about never sharing a doubt, that was it. To this day, as all good politicians, all good senior management and CEOs of public companies, I don't share any doubts. Now, the day before Mr. Nixon resigned as President of the United States, I believe it was 1974, on the Friday before the Monday, everything was fine. He wasn't resigning, yet he resigned and he was given uh, clemency or whatever it's called by President Ford. Um, when Donald Trump filed bankruptcy a few years ago, he got off on the Friday before the Monday and said nothing was further from the truth. Everything couldn't be better. When you see people that are running for president, the presidency or the governorship or the U.S. Congress, the day before they resign, they have no intention of resigning. You see it time and time again. People, they never share their doubts. Yet, always in business, you hear, oh, things are going lousy. I'm not going to be able to make payroll. Things aren't going our way. Interest rates are against us. All you hear is doubt. And we wonder why the smaller companies, the less sophisticated companies, the companies that don't follow or, and or believe, not and or, but and believe in the quantum leap methodology, they share doubts. Did you ever hear Gates, Dell, Jobs, Lee Iacocca, one of, the, one of the great sales jobs of all time was Lee Iacocca getting up and telling Congress that he could turn around Chrysler. There was no way he could turn around Chrysler. Zero. It's one of the, one of the great BS lines of all time, of all business in this century. You don't share doubts. If you don't follow anything else in the quantum leap methodology, you're going to be a lot better off and you're going to be a lot farther down the continuum towards geometric growth if you don't share doubts. And this is part of walking your talk. You are visualizing positive occurrences. You are always acting as if you have no limits to your abilities. Now, step number eight. You're putting together a critical path. Now, who's going to put this critical path together? You know. It's your other decision makers. Now, of course, for those of you that are listening to this tape that don't have other decision makers and you have no other levels of management other than you, you, and you, well, then you're doing all these steps. Okay, so number eight is a critical path. If you have other decision makers, they're putting it together. If you don't, it's you. Now, what do I mean by a critical path? Now, I don't mean it so much like in the MBA sense. Um, I mean it more like a detailed observation of a timeline. In other words, on Monday or Tuesday or on February the 16th through the 20th or March the 5th through the March the 8th, these things should be happening. If they're not happening, then that affects certain other decision trees. And so you've put together this timeline so you can see very accurately if you're on target. It's one thing being one or two or three days off target as opposed to six or eight or 10 or 12 months off target. And what I see when people put together these timelines, they put them together all too generically. And so it's very difficult to, to notice that you really are off target. Okay. And, the, and, and the, the next thing that I see when people do put together a timeline or a critical path is they forget that it has to be continually measured. There's continual measurement. You know, when we, we, we fire a rocket ship that goes to the moon or to Mars or wherever they're going nowadays, 90% of the time it's off target. How do we get it back on target? And obviously there's been a critical path put together. They didn't just fire the rocket uh, that carried men to the moon a number of years ago and, and it get there willy-nilly. It's continued a readjustment. What we do is when we have a plan, we have a critical path or we have a business plan, but we, we write it down like it's in concrete, like it's the Bible. It's like the Ten Commandments. We put it in the top drawer, and then we never, if we look at it, we sure as heck then never change it. All critical paths, all business plans have to be continual, continually measured and monitored. 
The ninth step in our quantum leap action plan is the implementation of this plan up to step eight. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, again, if you have levels of management beyond yourself, then it's your other decision makers that are doing the implementation, not you. For those of you that started your company with just one employee, you, then it's you, you, and you again, just as I did when I started Great Western Resources with $820, a lease fax machine, and a phone, and a spare bedroom, which ultimately became the nursery of my, uh, my oldest son. Okay, so now how are we going to implement? We're going to write this plan, we're going to monitor it, and, but you're going to have the follow-up of the plan of the implementation, again, for those of you that have other than yourself, and you're going to have the follow-up of at all the other levels. Not your, you're not going to be following up. You're not going to be calling. You're not going to be saying, oh, item B on page six, line seven, hasn't been done yet. It's not you. Remember, quantum leap methodology is all about macro thinking, not micro thinking. It's about concept selling, not individual item selling. So you're going to have other people following up and making sure that each and every aspect of the plan has been implemented. Now, you're also going to have the follow-up at the other decision-maker levels. It's not going to be you. They will follow up to make sure. So you may have, if your organization is large enough, you may have two or three levels following up on the implementation from senior to junior. Okay, step number 10 is what I call the execution. Now, what do I mean by that? It kind of sounds that perhaps step number eight and nine are kind of execution, a form of execution. No, that's not really what I mean. By execution, I mean the other levels of decision makers that are both carrying out the critical path and the implementation are staying laser beam focused. But more importantly, now these are the people that you're staying focused on to make sure that it happens. You are not going down to middle management as some of the companies I'm involved in right now. The founder will go down and tell a marketing guy that the bullet points and a marketing piece are no good. Well, first of all, he shouldn't be doing that, number one. Number two, if he has any comments, he should be going to, for example, the vice president of marketing or the director of marketing, not the poor guy that's writing the bullet points. So to the extent that they're, you're focused, you're focused not on the actual person that's doing the work. You're focused on the people that he reports up through. Now, another part of execution is leading from the front. What do I mean by leading from the front? Well, I've used a number of analogies over the years, but part of which is never, ever second-guessing your employees. People have heard me say that um, part of um, the conventional wisdom is that, you know, we're not supposed to make mistakes. And you've heard me say time and time again that Mr. Gates, the founder of Microsoft, actually pays bonuses for making mistakes. If he's paying bonuses for making mistakes, and why does he do that? He pays large dollar bonuses for making mistakes because he wants people to stretch. He wants people to get outside the box. He wants people to, as they say, uh, push the, uh, um, the, the sides of the envelope. Uh, you want people to think that there are no rules vis-a-vis -vis what they're doing. So if that's the case, then you can't expect or you can't tolerate people within your organization that will second guess and say, John, if you had done this, this would have happened. You've heard me say that I, when I am making a suggestion to somebody that I work with, I say next time. Implicit in next time is there's going to be a next time. If there's going to be a next time, it's because you're not going to fire his butt or her butt for making a mistake. There are organizations that I've walked into in recent years that realize that they have what I call a zero-tolerance zero system. And we're not talking about manufacturing tolerance. We're talking about zero tolerance to mistakes. If somebody makes a mistake, they get their head lopped off. You can't expect people to grow, and you certainly can't expect your organizations to grow geometrically if you do not follow the idea that you can never second-guess anybody that's part of your organization. And more importantly than second-guess somebody that's part of your organization is you can never, ever, ever second-guess your I see more entrepreneurs, more founders of more organizations that live by the credo, what if I'd have, I'd have done this? What if I'd have been there? 
What if I'd have gone to that bank? What if I'd have made this manufacturing change? What if, what if, what if? I may be in, I may be wrong, but I'm never in doubt. You've heard me say that, and virtually all the high performing people that I'm aware of, and all the high performing people that I've had the pleasure to be exposed to and sit in meetings with and hear on the dais at various times in my business career, never second guess themselves. They never suffer under the syndrome of if Ida. It's extremely important because the if Ida syndrome can spread beyond the boardroom. It can spread down to the very most menial task being done in your organization. Now, we've gone through 10 steps. The 11th step is constant reevaluation of the first 10. I've already said what's wrong in my judgment with most business plans, most critical paths, and the like, are that they're written. You think they're the 10 commandments that came down from the mount and they're put in the top drawer of your desk and nobody's ever looked at them again. Nobody's ever refined them. Nobody's ever redefined what the objective was. Nobody has ever continued to measure them in an objective manner. The entire processes that we've just gone through, from number one, idea, identifying the idea, to number 10, the execution, has to be re constantly re reevaluated. One of the reasons the Great Western Resources was the fastest growing natural resource company in the United States for five years in a row, is the very reason that I'm involved in eight or nine rapidly growing companies today is we continue to reevaluate where we started from, where we are, and where we're going. Our vision has changed. Our mission statement is general. We want to dominate our industry in almost everything that I'm involved in. In fact, everything I'm involved in, we want to dominate. From that, things have changed. Some of you realize that I'm in the textile business, and the vision that we had in the textile business, fire resistance end of the textile business, has changed as our process has changed. We have become more proficient in certain areas of textile fire resistance wear and less proficient in others as the industry has grown in other areas where we thought we could be dominant. We are now dominant or potentially dominant in other areas. It's a constantly changing regimen. Now, let me just review our 11-step idea to execution plan. One, identify the idea. Two, investigate. Always investigate. Three, investigate some more. When you think you've investigated it all, you've probably only half done. Four, commitment to that idea. You are committed to that idea. You get obsessed. You get nuts. You get crazy. Five, Preliminary decision, that's you and others. You share your obsession with your other top decision makers and you live it totally. Six, investigate again. As I said, the investigation process never ends. You are, to you are always investigating, so at this juncture, after your preliminary decision by you and, and uh, your, your second level of managers, you're continuing to investigate. Number seven, I call it the action plan. That means you and the other decision makers further expand the, uh, your obsession throughout the organization. That's you and the other decision makers. And next, you walk your talk. And by walk your talk, I mean never, ever, ever, ever share any doubts with the project. The project is alive and well on the Friday, and it may be in bankruptcy on the Monday at 8 a.m. Number eight. Critical path, again, that, this critical path that's put together is put together by the other decision makers, not you. And that's more or less a, decision, uh, a detailed observation of a timeline. And remember, it's continually measured. It's not something static. Life isn't static, either is business. Number nine, your implementation. The implementation is by the other decision makers. And you have all the follow-up at all the other levels to the extent that you have other levels and you have follow-up by these decision makers. Number 10, the execution, that's a laser beam focused execution from you to the other decision makers 
and you lead from the front. And by lead from the front, again, I say you never second guess your people and you sure as hell never second guess yourself. And number 11 is a constant reevaluation of 1 through 10. If you follow these 11 steps, you will, one, enhance the probability of geometric and exponential growth dramatically, and especially the investigation phases of this 11 steps, the more you investigate, the less you'll have to invest.